Hello? Okay, that's a lot better. Sorry. So, as I was saying, I work on, what do I work on? <laughs> the computational modeling of human behavior. And one of the first projects that I did was a project on recognizing facial expressions in real time um, using machine learning and animating uh, computer characters in real time. This is something that we can do today on our mobile phones, but in the 90s, it was really advanced. Um, I also work on modeling human behaviors, like interactions. And at the time when I was at MIT, it was the time when uh, virtual reality and augmented reality were being developed and defined. So we had a chance to work on some augmented reality projects. And we also organized the first smart clothes fashion show in the world in 1997, where we collaborated with some of the best fashion schools in the world to add technology to their uh, designs. And these are some examples of the designs. Um, I also work on smart cars. Before there was autonomous driving like in the late 90s, and I built a car that could predict the next maneuver that the drivers were going to do uh, using um, a machine learning methods, dynamic graphical models. Um, and you can see how the system was working like in, in real time. Um, roughly around the time when mobile phones became more pervasive, I realized that if my goal was to create technology that would help people, the most personal computer was and was going to be the mobile phone. So I decided to change completely and work only on mobile phones, or all, almost only on mobile phones, to see if they could actually deserve their name of smartphones. So I did a lot of projects on health and wellness on mobile phones, uh, both while I was uh, at Microsoft Research and also when I was uh, director of research in Telefonica here in Spain, because I came back from the US to Spain at the end of 2007. So we did a lot of projects at the intersection of wearables, persuasive computing, uh, mobile phones, and machine learning to do all sorts of inferences about people, like predicting boredom or financial risk uh, uh, for developing countries, for the unbanked, or you know, availability, personality, et cetera. And since 2008, and this is the most relevant area for this talk, um, I've also been working on how to leverage large-scale data to model large-scale human behavior for social good, to support the 17 Sustainable Development Goals, but there were no 17 Sustainable Development Goals in 2008, so to sort of like have positive societal impact. And we did a lot of projects, particularly in developing countries, on using large-scale mobile data to, for example, um, analyze the impact of natural disasters, or automatically infer the socioeconomic status of regions to um, design interventions to prevent poverty or to model the spread of infectious diseases. So in 2009, with my team at Telefonica, we modeled the impact of the Mexican government interventions when the H1N1 flu outbreak took place. Um, with my team at Vodafone, uh, we uh, worked with the United Nations on the spread, on modeling the spread of uh, one of the worst Ebola outbreaks that took play, place in DRC, in, I think it was in 2017, 18, it's the summer of 2017, I think it was. Um, and at the time when uh, COVID-19 started to become a pandemic, I was actually working um, in collaboration with the University of Southampton and the Gates Foundation on a project on modeling the spread of malaria in Mozambique. Um, after having worked most of my life in industry, um, in 2018, I became very involved with ELIS. Does any of you know what ELIS is? ELIS? No? Okay, so ELIS means the European Laboratory for Learning and Intelligence Systems, and it's a European network of scientific excellence in uh, AI, and specifically in machine learning. Ellis was born in 2018 as a result of a grassroots movement of the European scientists working on machine learning because we were worried about the lack of competitiveness of Europe in machine learning when compared to North America and to China. And with Ellis, what we want is to create an environment that is sufficiently competitive 
us to attract and retain the best minds working in machine learning and related topics so they can actually stay in Europe and grow you know, in Europe and have impact in Europe. So it's a great initiative and I recommend you to check their website which is ellis.eu. So I'm co-founder of Ellis Europe. I'm also vice president of Ellis Europe. And within the different actions that Ellis is launching, one of them is the creation of Ellis units, where an Ellis unit is a research group that meets certain excellence criteria, scientific excellence criteria, but also commits to contributing to the mission and the vision of Ellis Europe. And in the fall of 2019, Ellis made the first competitive call for the creation of Ellis units. And with the support of the Valencian government, I made a proposal to create an Ellis unit here in Alicante called the Institute of Humanity-Centric AI. So the uh, results of the evaluation of this first call for proposals took place in NeurIPS of 2019. I assume you know what NeurIPS is? Uh, are, are you all working sort of like in AI and related topics? Ah, okay. Um, so it was the last NeurIPS before the pandemic and Elis Alicante was one of the 17 units that uh, were announced at that time. Right now there are 39 units, so the network has grown a lot. And so when the pandemic was starting, I was very busy trying to create this um, unit from scratch. So Elis Alicante is different from the other Elis units because it's being created from scratch as a research foundation. So we had to create a foundation uh, you know, from zero. And we work on these three areas. The first one is called artificial intelligence to understand us, and it's about the computational modeling of human behavior, always with the objective of social good. The second area is called artificial intelligence that interacts with us, and it's about understanding and, in, and inventing and, and modeling human AI interaction, which of course has become very relevant today with you know, chatbots and so forth. And the last area is called artificial intelligence that we trust, and it's about addressing the ethical, um, implications of AI systems, their limitations, but also analyzing the impact of AI on society. If you want to know more, I also encourage you to check out our website. So then we were busy doing all of this when, of course, the pandemic started. The World Health Organization announced that there was, gonna, there was a COVID-19 pandemic and the Spanish president uh, announced very severe confinement measures in Spain because of Spain, I don't know if you remember at the time, but it was basically uh, the second world in the country, in the, the second country in the world after Italy in impact of COVID-19. So COVID-19 hit Spain really, really hard at the beginning of the pandemic and we were subjected to the, one of the most severe confinements. In, definitely in the Western world. I don't mention the confinements in China, but in the Western world, our confinements were very, very tough. So, having worked on using data and machine learning to model the spread of infectious diseases, I felt that there was a lot of knowledge uh, and a lot of scientific results that could be used in the context of this pandemic, but maybe politicians you know, and decision makers didn't know about them, and maybe they were going to be using the same methods that were used when you know, the previous really bad pandemic took place in 1918, you know, the, the flu pandemic. So I decided to reach out and propose uh, the idea of creating a team of scientists working really closely with the decision makers on helping them make more informed decisions and more evidence-based decisions through the analysis of data using machine learning methods. So I reached out to the central government and I reached out to the Valencian government and this was mid-March 2020. And my proposal was received very, very, um, with, very well by the Valencian government. And very quickly, they um, organized a meeting with all the uh, experts in machine learning and related topics in the Valencian region of Spain. And very, very quickly, we created this team called the Data Science Against COVID-19 team. And the goal of our team was to assist in better decision making through the analysis of data using machine learning methods. And we work very closely with the president of the region. This was a, a pretty large multidisciplinary team that involved researchers from the different universities, including the University of Alicante, of course, and also from research centers. We had never met before. I had never met anyone in that group before. Uh, we, we never saw each other in person for over a year, but we saw each other 
every day and sometimes more than once a day you know, per video conference. Uh, our, the main goal for our work was to fill this gap. The gap that there is between where the data sources are and where the decision makers are. The data is not directly usable by the decision makers. So someone has to understand this data, digest the data, turn it into actionable insights that can actually be used by, in our case, the presidency of the Valencian government. So to fill the gap, we structure our work into four work streams within the larger data science group. The first area was modeling large-scale human mobility. Of course, an infectious disease that is transmitted from human to human doesn't become a pandemic if people don't move. And that's why mo modeling mobility is very important, and that's why we were confined for so many months, to try to geographically contain the pandemic. But there were a lot of questions regarding these confinements. You know, are the confinements working? Uh, are people being compliant with the confinements? Are they enough to stop the spread of the virus? No one knew, right? So we were able to analyze large-scale mobility to be able to answer these questions. The second work stream was on building computational epidemiological models. Models that would enable us to predict the number of COVID-19 cases, not only under the current situation, but also under different potential scenarios of different confinement measures. The third work stream was on building predictive models. Models to predict the hospital occupancy, the intensive care occupancy, but also models to infer the prevalence of the disease, especially in the first wave when there were no tests and we didn't know how many people had been infected. And the last area was a very large scale citizen survey called the COVID-19 Impact Survey, which we launched in March of 2020. It has more than 720,000 answers and is one of the biggest COVID-19 surveys right now in the world. All the result of all this work is still pretty technical. And as you see, there is a gap between the output of all these modules and where the policymakers are. And I think one of the key la layers for the success of our team is this layer here of results interpretation and translation you know, to actionable insights, which was mostly done by me in collaboration with a politician, the director general for public policy working with the president. So I think a very remarkable aspect of our group is that it was a multidisciplinary, multi-institutional group where even there were politicians that were members of the group and they actually came every day to our daily meetings. And if we hadn't had that, I think we wouldn't have had the impact that we did. Mm -hmm. We had a very intense way of working. I organized meetings every day, uh, obviously over video conference. We had a Slack channel. We used GitHub to share the code. And every day I wrote a report with the predictions of the day and some insights on what I thought the presidency should know, you know, regarding some interesting maybe studies that had been published or some, you know, directions that we thought, you know, uh, should be investigated. This is an example of one of our pictures. This is one of the professors from here, uh, Professor Miguel Angel Lozano that was uh, here before. Um, we have also an official website on the government's uh, webpage. Um, and something that, you know, became very obvious is that it's not easy to create a team like our team. And that's why our effort was quite unique in the world. And there are many challenges and reasons why it's not easy. First of all, there is really a lack of a digital mindset and a data-driven mindset in most of the public administrations and governments in the world. So while most companies had already undergone a uh, data revolution, and most companies today, particularly large companies, are very data-driven, governments hadn't undergone such a transformation. So it was really not the way of thinking and the way of working that they had. Of course, there is difficulties in terms of accessing the data, and there are concerns about privacy. All the results that I'm going to share with you and all the data that we had access to was data that was fully anonymized and aggregated. We didn't analyze any individual data or any private data. So um, there were really no concerns regarding all the analysis that we did. And then, of course, there is a gap between where research ends and where the real world starts, and how to fill that gap has always been a challenge. And now I'll quickly give you some, um, an overview of some of the results in each of the areas, starting with the mobile, uh, large-scale mobility um, area. This is a visualization of some of the um, data that we analyzed. So Spain was very lucky because in the fall of 2019, before the pandemic, 
the Spanish National Institute of Statistics had launched a pilot on using um, a mobility data that was the result of combining the data from the three largest telcos in Spain, which is Telefonica, Vodafone, and Orange, to compute commuting matrices and mobility matrices to compute uh, official statistics in a more efficient and economical way. So this was the result of a couple of years of work between the Spanish National Office of Statistics and, and the telecommunications companies. And that was right before the pandemic. So when the pandemic happened, understanding the value of the data to model the spread of the disease, this pilot was continued and the Vice President of Spain, Calviño, appointed us, the Valencian region, as a pilot region in Spain to be able to use this data in the context of the pandemic. The data eventually became publicly available on the website of the National um, Office of Statistics in the summer of 2020, but we were able to use the data since March of 2020. So that was really lucky because it's not very common that a country would have access to this kind of data, like the government of a country, um, a right, you know, ready to be used um, during a pandemic. Using this data, uh, we were able to answer some questions that the government wanted to answer. And one of them was the success of the stay at home campaign. So in Spain, there was a very big campaign encouraging people to stay at home. Of course, the data doesn't have the spatial granularity to uh, determine if you are in your home, uh, but the concept of home is sort of like the area of residence, which is represented here. This is the spatial granularity of the uh, mobility data, and um, these irregularly shaped areas satisfy the following condition. They have to have at least 5,000 people sleeping there for privacy reasons. So areas that are not very uh, populated, they are very large to really include 5,000 people. And areas that are very densely populated, as you see, the regions are very small. The municipalities um, that have less than 5,000 inhabitants, they are all merged together to reach an area with 5,000 people. Municipalities between 5,000 and 70,000 people only have one of these areas. And municipalities that are larger are split into different areas. So analyzing this data, we were able to um, determine that on average, 88% of the population on working days and 92% of the population during weekends did not leave this area of residence during the period of the first major confinement, uh, during the first wave of COVID-19 in 2020. So as you can see, the map is really green. Green means you know, uh, larger than like 80% uh, compliance, so there was a fair amount of compliance in terms of staying at home. This is a visualization of the progression of the percentage of people staying at home since the very first day of the confinement in Spain until the last day of like, sort of like the heaviest confinement. And as you see, the map is pretty green, but the, initially it, there wasn't a huge amount of compliance, but then Spain implemented a very rigid uh, two-week um, no-mobility campaign where only people f that were worked in essential services were able to actually leave their homes. And as you see, the map became pretty much 100% green during that period. It was a very, very severe confinement, but there was a very large impact in the mobility of the population. We also did all the analysis with a different spatial granularity, which is the spatial granularity of the Departments of Health. The Department of Health is the, is the region that is served by a hospital and is a um, geographical representation that is meaningful from a public health perspective. So in the Valencian region, there are 24 departments of health, and this is the percentage of um, stay-at-home people per Department of Health on weekdays in like reddish color and during weekends on the brownish color. And this was helpful to identify if there was any Department of Health that had more mobility you know, than others and anticipate you know, there was going to be more cases in those areas. We also studied the impact of these measurements on labor mobility. So the biggest source of human mobility is actually labor mobility. And to do that, we compared the mobility during the confinement period with the mobility of a pre-confinement period in November of 2019. And what this graph shows is the drop in labor mobility with respect to November of 2019. And we found that on average, there were 60% fewer people 
outside of their area of residence during working hours, so people that were moving because of labor mobility, um, during the confinement period than um, a, a, a pre-pandemic um, period in November of 2019. Because we had incoming and outgoing flows of mobility, we defined a measure called activity levels, which was the uh, combination of the incoming and the outgoing mobility. And that allow us to identify some areas that were having very high levels of activity, which are marked in orange and red, versus other areas that didn't have almost any you know, uh, activity. And uh, we were able to see the evolution. This was at the beginning of the pandemic. And this was, for example, when we had the major confinement where no one could leave their homes. And as you see, the entire map became green, which means there was a huge like, drop in the activity levels. We did the same. Uh, of course, uh, per Department of Health to have an understanding of the impact on the Departments of Health. A very important lesson learned is that all of these analyses are interesting and they are valuable, but um, it's very important to build visualization tools that enable the users of this to be able to actually play a little bit with the data and ask, answer additional questions that they might have. So we developed several visualization tools like this one where you could click in any municipality and you would see the incoming mobility, the outgoing mobility, the percentage of people that stayed home, um, and you could determine the, the time frame so you could see the evolution over time and so forth. Because we had um, the mobility flows, we could run a community detection algorithm to identify what we call mobility communities. And this was important because at some point there was the idea of doing partial confinements. Instead of confining the entire region, just confining some parts of the region. Understanding how connected a part of the region is to other regions is very important to determine whether a partial confinement actually makes sense or doesn't make sense. Um, we identified 14 mobility communities that were, in some cases, very self-contained, like this one, where there was only, there was 94% of internal community, uh, internal mobility, to uh, the least confined one, the least self-contained one, which had 41%. So confining this area, for example, for example, where the vast majority of the mobility is internal, doesn't really do much because it doesn't have a lot of connections with other areas, so it doesn't matter if you confine it, right? So this was helpful to understand how the different regions you know, were connected to each other. These were some examples of the uh, analysis that we did on the mobility. The second area that we worked on was on building computational epidemiological models. So models that would predict the number of COVID-19 cases under different scenarios. And we built three different models. We built three different models of different nature because that's another lesson learned. No model is perfect, reality is very complex, and it gave us more confidence to have alternative approaches, um, more confidence in our predictions if all the approaches were agreeing on you know, the prediction that they were making. The first model that we built. Can I have a question? Yeah. Um, so, how did you get the data of mobility of people during the pandemic? Was it also from the uh, mobile operators, I mean, telecommunication services operators? Yeah, so this was the data that the Spanish National Office of Statistics was already um, processing and collecting from the operators, and the National Office of Statistics shared it so with us. It was on a daily basis, and it was not coming from the mobile. It, was, it wasn't data captured by smartphones. It was data captured by the mobile network infrastructure, by the cell towers. Yeah, and it was done on a daily basis. Yeah, we were very lucky that we had that. Um, the first computational epidemiological model that we built is the most traditional, traditional one, which is a SAIR metapopulation compartmental model. This model assumes that the population can be in four different states and defines different probabilities to, of transitioning from one state to another state. The first state is susceptible, and because COVID-19 was a new disease, we assumed that everyone was susceptible of getting the disease. Then with a certain probability beta, the, the population that is susceptible might get exposed to the virus. With a certain probability, they might become infectious and infected. And with a certain probability, they might re get retired from the system, which means they recover or they die. So this model is uh, determined by this set of differential equations. And there were some estimations of each of the different parameters from China that we used initially to start uh, getting this model working, but then we uh, fine-tuned it to the actual data from the Valencian region. 
because we also had the mobility information, we also modified this model to include mobility. And actually, Professor Miguel Angel Lozano from here, from the University of Alicante, was uh, one of the key people that worked on this. This is an example of the predictions that the model was making in red versus uh, the ground truth in dashed uh, uh, lines. So it's pretty good uh, to allow us to make uh, daily predictions. The second approach that we followed is an agent-based system. In this case, you don't model a metapopulation, but you model each individual in the population. These systems are much more fine-grained and accurate, but computationally, they are very costly. The Valencian region only has 5 million inhabitants, so you can afford to do it, but if you are trying to model a country with 300 million inhabitants, it requires significant computation and a lot of time to get you know, any meaningful simulations. So we um, adapted an existing framework called RENA, um, to the Valencian region, and we run simulations every day on the number of COVID-19 cases, the number of hospitalized, the number of intensive care units uh, occupancy, and the, and the number of uh, deceased um, using this model. So in this model, you have 5 million agents, because the Valencian region has 5 million inhabitants, and we took uh, information from the census to determine their, ge their gender, their age, and their contact matrix, because the agents interact with each other with a certain probability, and that determines whether they will get infected or not. And then underlying, there is also a SAIR model, like the, the model that I just described. And then last but not least, we built a third model using deep neural networks. And this model, we built it in the context of this competition called the XPRIZE Pandemic Response Challenge. So in November of 2020, the XPRIZE Foundation, have you heard of the XPRIZE Foundation, anyone? No? Okay. So there is this foundation, where is it? Here, XPRIZE, here, which I recommend you to check out. It's been running for many years, and it runs world, global competitions on topics that are supposed to be sort of like social challenges. They have, I think it was like a hundred million won sponsored by Elon Musk on decarbonization of the planet. This one was a 500,000 one um, on the use of AI to uh, tackle the pandemic. So mostly teasing, I sent to the team this uh, uh, link that I got on email um, saying, well, hey guys, there is this competition. If you, what do you think? Do you think we should participate? And a couple of people in the team were very enthusiastic and they said, yes, yes, we should participate. And I acted a little bit like the devil's advocate because I was like, well, this is a, a, a different level. We've been modeling the Valencian region of Spain. This is modeling the entire planet. And it's gonna be very intense because it's gonna start in November and it's gonna end in March of 2021. So it's gonna be all Christmas working on this. Um, yes, 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 let's do it, let's do it. So a subset of the team, we created a, an entry called Valencia IA for COVID-19, and we decided to participate in the competition. Because um, this competition asked us to build predictions on the number of COVID-19 cases in 236 regions and countries in the world up to six months into the future, and taking into account any intervention that was implemented in each of these 236 regions and countries in the world, we decided to do a full-fledged data-driven machine learning approach and we used this um, um, architecture of deep neural networks where uh, we had sort of like two um, types of models. We had the models that were modeling the number of cases, which as you see here, there was bi-directional LSTMs with some convolutional layers um, initially. And there was a bank of them because we clustered the countries in, I think it was nine different clusters, depending on their behavior, and then we had uh, different um, strains of um, the networks depending on the dynamics of you know, the countries. And then we had another, another um, architecture at the bottom, which was modeling the impact of the interventions, which are called actions, which we, we were then combining in this lambda layer to um, model the impact that the interventions were having on the number of COVID-19 cases. Um, our uh, model worked pretty well during the competition. It was the third best of all the countries in the world in mean rank, and then the first in all the European and Asian countries. Uh, but probably the most valuable um, impact of this model was that we finished the model in December of 2020, right before the Delta wave 
which took place after Christmas between 2020 and 2021, and which was, which was the worst wave here in the Valencian region of Spain. Uh, it was an extremely stressful time. And we were able to use the model to predict the wave and to predict the number of cases. In yellow is the ground truth, in blue is our predictions, and in red is a competitive, sort of like a state-of-the-art model. Um, and we kept improving this model and added vaccination, and it became really good. And this is an example of how we predicted the last wave of COVID, the Omicron wave, uh, which took place at the end of 2021, beginning of 2022. And as you see, it did a really good job when compared to like other, um, other models. Uh, as part of the XPRIZE competition, they ask us not, not only to predict the number of COVID-19 cases, but they ask us to build like an artificial politician. They wanted us to build a predictor of non-pharmaceutical interventions. Given any country in the world and any point of time to identify up to 10 different public policies that would have the best trade-off between their cost, because of course these interventions have a huge cost, and the expected number of COVID-19 cases. So we had to find the Pareto front in a two-dimensional space where on the one axis we have the cost of the interventions and on the other axis we have the expected number of COVID-19 cases. The interventions could be of 12 different types. For example, you know, mobility interventions, uh, labor interventions, um, uh, school interventions, uh, uh, and so forth. Um, to do that, we um, followed uh, sort of like um, we developed different methods and we combined them because finding the actual uh, solution was not tractable. They only gave us six hours to find this Pareto front. So we came up with different sort of like shortcuts to be able to identify the 10 policies that, um, that we were suggesting for any country. And then we also built some visualizations so the policymakers could click on a country and then it would tell them these are the 10 possible policies that you could apply, and this is their cost. So you could determine, okay, you know, for the same cost, I have all of these ones, so I'll just choose the one, you know, that, uh, that maybe uh, impacts the less um, uh, the society. And um, in March of 2021, they announced the results of the competition, and we were actually the award winners of this competition. So that was really very motivating for the team and very um, exciting for us because it sort of validated our work and I think it was the first time that a team from Spain won an next prize competition. And we also won $250,000, which was nice. Um, we published some uh, papers about this. Uh, we won the first best paper award in the data science um, track in um, ECMLPKDD, and we also presented the work in HK 2022. Um, another analysis that we did that was relevant for the government was the impact of contact tracing. As you probably know, uh, the Control strategy that was adopted in most countries in the world was called TTI, which means test to know whom to trace, to know whom to isolate. So contact tracing became very important. And of course, we also knew that we couldn't contact trace every single positive case. So we did a study on what percentage of contact tracing was necessary to be able to flatten the curve, assuming that everyone could self-isolate. But as you will see later, we also knew that roughly 50% of the people couldn't self-isolate. And I think that was one of the weakest, actually, uh, points of the pandemic. Uh, and as I mentioned, we continued our models uh, once there was vaccination available, and particularly the agent-based model and the deep learning-based model. The third uh, work stream was building predictive models. And here we build two types of models. The first big question that the government wanted to answer, I don't know if you remember, was, okay, the first wave is over in April of 2020. Um, have we reached herd immunity? Is there going to be another wave? Or are there enough people that have been infected so there won't be any more waves? And the reason why we couldn't answer this question is because there were no tests. I don't know if you remember, but we didn't have PCR capability. So there was this big unknown of how many people had actually been infected with COVID-19 that no one could answer. So there was really a lot of uncertainty. So we tried to answer that question. And the first way we answered the question was, in March of 2020, we launched a very large scale survey that I will explain next. And in that survey, we asked people for their symptoms. And one of the reasons to ask for their symptoms was precisely because there were no tests. So we thought, okay, maybe we, maybe we can build a model that can actually infer the prevalence from the answers to the survey. 
So um, these are some of the answers to the survey, which as you can see are symptoms, the age, the gender, and then the presence of a member in the home infected. And then we just built a generalized linear model to infer the prevalence from all these variables. And according to that, according to our model, uh, the Valencian region after the first wave, we had between 1.6 and 3.4 sort of like percent prevalence. So our message was we are really far away from 70% you know, uh, prevalence and there will be more waves for sure because almost nobody you know, has been infected. Later on, there was a seroprevalence study that was done, which is the actual scientific way to do this, like the golden standard. And our estimations were actually really at par with the seroprevalence study, but we were able to answer this question uh, uh, many weeks before the seroprevalence study was done. We also answered the question looking at the deaths and the excess deaths and trying to infer from there how many people were infected, and we got to a very similar result. And then we also um, inferred the uh, percentage of infected based on the underlying number of infected individuals in our SAIR model. And following that um, uh, model, we also reached the same number. So with completely three different methods, we actually reached very similar estimations. So our answer to the president was no, we haven't reached herd immunity and there is going to be more waves as soon as we lift the, the measures. The other predictive model that we built that was pretty helpful was a deep learning based model, LSTM based actually, to predict hospital occupancy, intensive care occupancy um, for COVID-19 patients and for the general population, for the general non-COVID-19 patients. And this was very necessary because there was a lot of stress in the healthcare system and a big worry was that we were going to run out of beds and that we were going to run out of respirators. So we did these predictions at the Department of Health level, so at each of the hospitals. We predicted every day how many um, hospitalizations we were expecting and how many um, intensive care um, beds we were expecting to be occupied. And last but not least, we launched a very large-scale citizen survey. The reason why we launched this survey is because we had a lot of questions that we didn't have any data to be able to answer them. Questions, I mentioned before the symptoms, you know, questions related to the symptoms, but also questions related to the compliance of the confinement measures, questions related to the psychological impact of the pandemic on people's lives, the economic impact, the labor impact, questions related to the behavior of people, you know, where people um, keeping any kind of like distance from each other, where people socializing, we had way too many questions and too few answers. So we um, invested a, a fair amount of effort in a very short amount of time to try to design the shortest possible survey that would give us the most information. And we converged to a survey that had 26 questions. And we launched it on March 28, 2020, at 8 p.m. And we um, had a lot of volunteers that helped us translate it to many different languages. The survey became vital and extremely popular, which was really lucky for us. And just to give you a figure, in the first 40 hours, we collected 140,000 answers and we collapsed the servers. Originally, we were using Google Forms and we had collapsed Google Forms, so we moved to AWS and we actually changed also. We developed the entire survey uh, code ourselves mm, to be more private, even though, it is, because it's 100% anonymous, to really make sure there was absolutely nothing, no IP address being collected or anything, and to also uh, be faster and, and have more capacity. Um, given this massive response, we um, tried to analyze the data as quickly as possible and share the data as quickly as possible so people could benefit from our findings. And we wrote this paper very quickly uh, where we shared the main insights that we drew from this data that actually applied for the entire pandemic. But of course, the survey continued for many more months. We also developed two different visualizations so anyone could access the data and, and see how things were going. And we had data mostly from Spain, but also from Germany, Italy, Brazil, and then many other countries, but we had not, not as much data as from those countries. Um, we wrote a lot of papers about this if you are interested, but I just give you a some highlights or some uh, of the uh, you know, findings that we got. The first one was on the emotional impact. Since day one, the most impacted demographic group emotionally, according to our survey, was the youth. The people aged 18 to 29. 
and particularly the females in that group. As you see here, over half, 54% of the female respondents aged 18 to 21 reported having stress levels that they consider negative for their health or having even loneliness that they thought was negative for them. So one of our first messages since day one to the government was we, you need to do something for the youth. The youth is being really impacted by the pandemic. Um, there has to be some programs, there has to be something to support them emotionally because the impact is going to last and it's not going to be nice. We also had um, a question about the perception of the government measures, which is always interesting to see, you know, what do people think about the measures? And the yellow line shows the percentage of people that they thought that the government should do more. And it suspiciously correlates with the waves. So whenever there is a wave, people think that they should be doing more. And whenever there is no wave, you know, the people that think that is enough, you know, kind of like goes up. But it's curious that for the entire pandemic, the sentiment was that they, sh that they should be doing more which I don't understand because we were confined for like weeks that we couldn't even leave our home. I'm like, what more can they do? But you know, the people, some people, you know, a lot of people wanted the government to do more. We also had a very interesting information about the individual protection measures, you know, what people do to prevent getting infected. And here there are some interesting patterns all throughout the pandemic. The first pattern is that women tend to be a lot more compliant than men throughout the pandemic. The percentage of women that complied with the measures was significantly larger than the men. The second interesting result is that, well, in Spain it was compulsory to wear. This is actually results from very, very late. I also have the results from early on. Early on this was like 95 or really high because in Spain it was compulsory to wear masks. So the most commonly adopted measure was wearing masks. But something that we also told the government every week was that the least adopted measure was ensuring good ventilation, even though we knew that ventilation was absolutely necessary. So we really told the government it would be positive to do communication campaigns, really highlighting how important it is for people to be in ventilated spaces because the virus is, tr is transmitted you know, through aerosols and it's, they are not doing it. It's like the least adopted measure. Another interesting result is that Spain was one of the countries with the highest willingness to get vaccinated. The willingness was not over 95%, I think, on average. This is when people were already vaccinated many times, so this is just like residual, but it was very, very high intention to get vaccinated. We had data, for example, from Germany. I don't know if there's anyone from Germany here, but the willingness to get vaccinated in Germany was very low compared to Spain. Um, we also had this interesting question, which is very interesting about human behavior. We asked people to rate um, how um, safe they thought that it would be to do all these different things from the perspective of getting COVID-19. And the first observation, this is the data for the entire pandemic since like April of 2020 until like the end of the pandemic. And what is the activity that people think is the safest throughout the entire pandemic? Doing sports individually outdoors. Okay, it makes sense. I don't know how you're gonna get a pandemic if you are doing sports individually outdoors. But the interesting thing is the least safe that throughout the entire pandemic, everyone thought it was the least safe was, can anyone guess? Well, it says here, right? Flying by plane. Even though there weren't really any documented outbreaks of flying by plane, you know, and getting like everyone in the plane getting the outbreak. So there is a big correlation between what we did and what we thought it was safe. And because we were not flying, I think we were just, oh, it must be really unsafe, you know, because we are not flying. And then there is some interesting behavior, for example, going to the beach, which is sort of like middle of the way, but then in the summer months, it goes up a lot, so people think it's safe, but then in the winter months, you know, people don't think it's very safe. So again, you know, it's very correlated, you know, to the kind of things that we do. We use this a lot also to give ideas on communication campaigns to sort of like demystify some activities, you know, that were safe or vice versa, and that people, you know, had the wrong perception. This was a very important question. As I told you, the mitigation strategy, the control strategy was the TTI strategy, test, uh, trace, isolate. Very few people looked into the capacity, the ability for people to self-isolate. So we had a question about that. And the main conclusion is that roughly half the people that were 59 and younger reported that they were not able to self-isolate if they had to. So it doesn't matter if you trace people 
if then they are not going to be able to self-isolate because they're going to infect everyone that they are with. So we really suggested doing programs to encourage, to sort of like support people for in self-isolation where it wouldn't be a burden for the people, you know, it would be something that they could do um, easier. We also found a very significant impact on the youth um, when the reasons not to self-isolate were psychological. As you can see here, a fairly large percentage of the youth say that they couldn't self-isolate because psychologically they couldn't do it or because of fear of stigmatization, which at some point in the pandemic, there was fear of stigmatization if you reported that you couldn't see someone because you had COVID-19. And then we also found a very interesting uh, gender difference. When we look at the reason of not being able to self-isolate because of having to take care of others, we find that 28% of the women aged 30 to 59 said that they couldn't, but only 13% of the men, which are presumably the fathers of the same children. So throughout the pandemic in different questions, I showed you the one about the emotional impact. We did find a very significant um, differential impact of the pandemic on women versus on men. And we also highlighted that you know, many times to the government. And then last but not least, we looked into the contact tracing app. I don't know if any of you used any contact tracing app. Anyone? No? Okay, so you are representative of this data then. <laughs> so as you remember, you know, there was these apps and you know, they were supposed to do contact tracing using Bluetooth, which is completely the wrong technology to be using it, but anyways. So we really looked into to see if this app actually worked and this is what we got. So we got about 140,000 answers of which roughly 30% reported having the app installed. So that's very high adoption, a lot higher than in this room. Out of these 42,000 people that had the app installed, 3,200 told us that they knew they had had a contact with a positive case. They knew because the person told them or because you know, they got sick and they had the contact trace and whatever it is, they knew. However, out of these 3,200, only 86 reported that they actually discovered it thanks to the app, of which only 27 got tested. There's a huge gap here, because I don't know in your countries, but in Spain, they made it really hard to get tested if you got the app, if you got a positive um, notification on the app. You had to go to the doctor. The doctor had to enter some unique alphanumeric code. It was really complicated. And then of those, only seven actually tested positive. So out of a pool of 140,000 people, the app helped identify seven positive cases. So it was really very anecdotal impact. And the last, I guess, interesting finding that we had was a study that we published in Nature, scientific reports on social isolation, which we call the other pandemic. We found terrifying percentages of social isolation in the general population. This is like the largest study, I think, that has been done to date on social isolation in the population, not in the elderly, but in the general population. And we found that for the age groups between 40 years old and 59 years old, the social isolation levels were like reaching roughly 30% of the population, which is huge. It should be like below 10%. So we talk a lot about this in this paper. So what did we learn after all this work? So the biggest lesson, which is the, the most obvious one, is that a pandemic is not just a public health problem or challenge. It is a societal challenge and it requires a holistic, you know, multidimensional uh, perspective. Many people ask me like, how come were you able to do this for like over two years? You know, there are very few examples like this and what are the reasons why, you know, this happened? And I think one of the most important reasons is because we had a pre-existing trusting relationship with the government and with the politicians because of different reasons. One of them because the government had published the Valencian AI strategy and they had already worked with a lot of the scientists on AI. And the government had also committed on using AI uh, in the public administration. So they have self-committed of using data and AI to support them. So I think it was very aligned with their thinking. So I think that was probably the most important uh, reason, the fact that there was a willingness and, 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 a, and a serious effort on the government side to be able to use this. And then, of course, a sustained volunteer effort by all the scientists you know, for such a long time. And just to conclude, I think what we also learned from the pandemic is we have the opportunity to create a virtuous cycle between data, between technology and people, and the data and the technology and the people should 
help us define the public policies that mitigate existing weaknesses you know, that we identify because of the analysis of the data. You know, like what I mentioned in terms of the impact on the youth or what I mentioned in terms of the lack of uh, ability of people to be able to self-isolate. We wrote a bunch of papers that are more kind of like policy-making papers if you have an interest in learning more about this. And we have a lot of scientific publications, talks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and perhaps this is interesting to you. Um, we, in Elis Alicante, because this project is an example of using of our first research area, which is the computational modeling of human behavior for social good. Um, a few months ago, we created Nexus, which is together with three other institutions, IRCAI, Data Pop Alliance, and CETIC. And this is a global network of AI excellence centers working on AI for sustainable development and working on AI for uh, social good, basically. And we have um, members in the network from many different countries, particularly a lot of countries in the global south. And this is all I have to tell you. Thank you very much. Is it time for questions? Any questions? So, any question? Uh, thanks for the wonderful presentation. I have a question. So, uh, was there anything uh, done in the direction of uh, helping people cope with uh, mental health issues uh, in the result of the pandemic? Uh, because I know in some countries, I, I don't remember which one, uh, like uh, there were like technology solutions to uh, like not uh, I mean uh, they were trying to make technology solutions for uh, coping with the anxiety and stress from the isolation so did you work on this topic on or did you propose something to the government was something implemented here in Spain on this yeah so do you hear the question everyone so it's about if there was anything done to, uh, based on our results on the, on the mental health impact and the emotional impact. So we didn't, we didn't um, implement any policy ourselves. What we did do is almost every week remind them, you know, this is a big challenge, this is a big issue. Um, then what, I don't know to which degree they actually did something specifically for the youth. Um, in our case, um, one, so, so some ideas where, I mean, it's not just even technological ideas. I mean, you could imagine, given that we knew that in open um, spaces, the probability of infection is much lower than in indoors, right? And Spain is a very social culture. So, um, you know, we, uh, we suggested, you know, maybe in, in emphasizing, given the fact also that people didn't really understand the importance of ventilation, you know, emphasizing socializing outdoors, doing activities outdoors, uh, the fact that going to the countryside was not dangerous, you know, encouraging like that people were, were able to go outdoors. And we did find that because in other data that we analyzed that I didn't show here, which was uh, Facebook data and Google data, they also shared aggregated mobility information. Uh, we did find that uh, the mobility to nature and outdoor places was actually um, larger than before the pandemic. So actually people started going outdoors and to nature and parks a lot more than before the pandemic. So, um, but we didn't, uh, as a group, we didn't um, work on implementing any specific measure for, for the youth. Uh, yeah. So we did everything we could to inform the, the, the policy making. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a very nice presentation. So I just missed one thing, what is your the future plan? Because I know the pandemic is over. So are you working on the behavior after the pandemic? What people think now, uh, which is thinking by the past and after that? Is it? Yeah, so that's a very good question. So we are mostly, we have mostly moved on uh, because we work day and night for over two years, and I think there is also a little bit of like cognitive exhaustion, you know, from working on this for so long. But 
And it's a pity that it's not here today because she's in Italy. We are actually hosting a Fulbright Scholar in Alice Alicante for six months. Her name is Kaylin Bolt. And she won a Schumann Innovation Award, which is one of the Fulbright programs that there are. And for six months, she is um, studying what we did and drawing sort of like policy making conclusions that she's going to take back to the US and then she's going to sort of like try to help the US you know to uh, learn you know for all the, from all the work that we did here so we are continuing the work a little bit i actually we also uh, we also have um, longitudinal sample from the survey that we didn't even have time to look at. So she's going to be also analyzing this longitudinal sample. And she's been doing interviews with a lot of the members of the task force and also with politicians and with healthcare workers. And I haven't seen uh, the results yet because she has been working on this, uh, on this data collection phase. She's gonna be here until July. So we'll probably have more results which is more like retrospective work, you know, um, um, this summer, starting this summer. Um, we also collaborating with, in Seattle, there is a, a very famous uh, public health institute called the Institute of Health Measurement. I don't know if you know it. Um, uh, so they contacted us because they do meta-analysis of public health um, I guess research, and they are doing a huge one on all the different uh, computational epidemiological models that we used during the pandemic. Uh, because we won the X Prize competition, people knew about our model, so they are also working sort of like this very big meta study on um, what models might make sense to be used in future pandemics, which might also be helpful. But the core of the research that we're doing right now at Elis Alicante is mostly on the third area, which is AI that we trust. So we have projects on algorithmic fairness, on algorithmic transparency. Actually, Julian is sitting there. He's working on algorithmic transparency, on privacy, um, on the impact of AI on society, and particularly um, uh, social media algorithms on women. So we have a project on the impact of beautifying filters. And we have another project on algorithmic censorship of art. And then we have a very interesting line of work about human uh, cognitive biases and how AI can help us humans make less biased decisions by being more aware you know, of our own biases. So we are doing a little bit of COVID-19, but mostly we have sort of like moved on into other, other topics. Uh, of course, we hope that everything we produce will be helpful for future uh, pandemics, but our core is not working on epidemi computational epidemiology, it's working more on like, as I mentioned, you know, the intersection between humans and, and AI, yeah. Thanks. I hope we don't have to work on pandemics <laughs> again, you know, it would be a good sign. <laughs> Thanks again for a wonderful uh, presentation. Um, I've got one question to you. Uh, is it possible for like, scholars from EU to work or cooperate somehow with Alice, with Alice Alicante? If so, how, how we could cooperate with you? Oh, great. Yeah, of course. Uh, so with Alice Europe, I mean, are you guys all PSE students? Yeah. Pretty much? OK, so if you have a publication, so if you go to Alice.eu, and you go to research, I think it is, and then you go, actually, I have a browser here. Um, you could potentially become Ellis PhD students. Um, let me show you the, so that's probably a, um, a fast way to get involved. Um, And you can, you can talk to Julian, he's an Ellis PhD student. He can tell you all the wonderful things about the Ellis PhD program. So to join the Ellis PhD program, there are two options. The first one, which I think you are too late, is to apply in the centralized recruitment track. But this is before you start the PhD. Julian is an example. He applied on the centralized one. But you can also join if you are already a PhD student um, here. If you are a PhD student, then if you have a first author publication in these venues, in any of these venues, you, you could potentially qualify to become an Ellis PhD student. But it is true that you need to have, as advisors, 
ELIS fellows or ELIS scholars that have to be based in Europe. Uh, the advantage of this program is that you have two PhD advisors that are in two different countries. For example, I could be secondary advisor. For example, we are secondary advisors for some people. And then the students ex spend six to 12 months working with the secondary advisor. So they have a mobility component. For example, Julian's secondary advisor is Professor Thomas Serre, and he's between France and the US, so Julian will be going six months, I don't know to which lab. Uh, Piera, for example, the student that is working on the social media impact of AI algorithms, um, She's right now in, uh, the the, in ETH Zurich because her secondary advisor is in Zurich. So it's a really nice, nice program. And it's a very prestigious program. And then you have the doctoral symposium once a year. You connect with like a really great team of like, you know, students. If you are about to graduate, you could also try joining Ellis as a postdoc. Again, as a postdoc, you also have to have publications in these venues as a first author. You have to have a fellow uh, supervisor and a secondary. So it's the same, but for postdocs. So that's another option. Um, in terms of then, if it's just mostly like a visiting collaboration and so forth, the specific case of Elis Alicante, we are very open to visitors and collaborators. We almost have visitors every, um, every month. We have like different visitors. So if any of you, wants to sort of like just come here and, you know, hang out with us for some weeks, you know, if your advisors let you or whatever, you know, that's also always a possibility. We are very flexible and, and very open. Um, so I think it's more of a matter of wanting and, you know, if we, if we find a, I mean, if we want to collaborate, I think we'll find a way to collaborate. So if any of you is working on any of the topics that I described before in terms of Ellis Alicante, or if you are interested more broadly speaking on Ellis Europe, I, I encourage you to look at the website. It's, it has become a really, really nice, prestigious like network. Being an Ellis PhD student now is a little bit like a status symbol. So um, it's, a, it's a good thing to know about. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You are from Saarbrücken, from Saarland? Uh, I'm from Poland. Ah, okay, from Poland. Because in Saarland there is another Elis node. Uh, but this Saarland is part of the alliance. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, there is a, there is a uh, Elis unit in Saarbrücken, which I think is the combination of uh, Max Planck with the University of Saarbrücken. Actually, if you go to the Elis uh, website, there is a tab called units here, uh, research units. And then here you can see all the LS units. Um, uh, what is the, the list here? So if you look at the list of units, um, Saarbrücken here. So the one from Saarbrücken, the directors of the unit is Ben Schiele. You know Ben Schiele, anyone? Computer vision person. He was a postdoc at MIT when I was a student at MIT, okay. so I know him for a long time. And then these are the members of the Saarbrücken Ellis unit. So if any of these is your advisor, then you immediately probably qualify for to be to join the Ellis program if you have a publication where you are a first author in those venues. Yeah. So check it out, and maybe it's something that will will interest you. You know, maybe for the after the PhD or during the PhD. Yeah. So thank you so much, Muria. Thank you.